Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, excellent. All right, cool. So we're going to talk about index monads today. And choosing to talk about monads is always a crowd pleaser at this conference. So I'm sort of happy about giving this talk. Um, so first off, who am I? Or why should you listen to me at all? Um, my name is Felix, and I worked on the Scala 212 docs compiler um, that you're all probably using if you're not stuck on waiting for Spark to be upgraded. Um, I was also a compiler engineer working with Guillaume, who you heard talk earlier today about Dottie. And right now, I'm a software engineer um, working with pure functional programming at this company called Klarna. And if you want to know more about that, just talk to one of these people who will raise their hands right now, or come see me after the show. Cool. So we're going to talk about functional states. And sort of this is like when you get into functional programming, you sort of have to relearn certain things. And state or state management is sort of one of these things. So today we'll be talking about the state monad, and the, finally we will get to the index state monad towards the end. So we'll do sort of a, like a bottom-up approach. So it will be, you know, it'll start off pretty easy and then get more and more hardcore as we go. So hopefully it will pre like please everyone in the room. So let's take this canonical example of how we model state. So essentially what we'll do is that we'll pass the state along. So if we want to create a random number generator, or in this case a pseudo random number generator, we'll pass along some initial seed that's known ahead of time. And then we'll get back a tuple of a new seed along with the randomly generated number. And now, using our RNG function, we can simply create a random Boolean generator just by reusing it and then checking if the random was greater than zero. So this seems like a perfectly fine example of how to model state. It doesn't seem too difficult. But let's take a simple example of adding three random numbers together. So you start off with some initial seed S0 up there. And then you sort of have to thread through the state everywhere that you want to generate a new random number. So if you forget to do this, you're going to be reusing probably an old seed. And you will not get a random number. So this seems like a lot of ceremony in order to be able to do something as simple as just adding three random numbers together. And yeah, also, this, these slides are compiled, so hopefully there's not too much hand waving going on. So how can we avoid passing the state explicitly? And as functional programmers, how can we compose things? How can we get rid of boilerplate? Those are sort of the two main questions that we're trying to answer today with the state monad. So really, what we had before can be generalized to this. We have a function from some state to a new state of the same type, along with some value a. So let's naively try to create a monad out of this, and we'll see what happens. So we'll just create like an anyval wrapper around this function. So we'll call it state. It'll take two type parameters, the state s and the value a. And inside, it'll just have one member run which goes from S to S and A. Simple enough. So now we can create a random number generator, or a random long generator. Let's call it next long, using this. So what we'll simply do is that we'll create a function from a seed, and then we'll apply the function RNG that we had before. So now we have something that we can pull values out of. And then, we want to create the same thing we had before with the random Boolean generator. Um, simply put, the only thing that we, were ca we care about here is being able to reuse code and sort of changing the value that this, this random number something will generate. So what we'd like to do is to implement map for this. So we want to implement this in such a way that we don't affect the A, or sorry, the S. We only want to affect the A. We want to change it essentially from a state SA into a state SB. So let's implement this in a naive way. Um, we'll simply do map as you usually see it. You take a function from A to B, and then we create a new state. So in the new state, we just simply put some function from S0 
then we run the outer context up there with that S0. We get out the next state and a value. And now we can simply pass along as a tuple S1, the new state, and then map the value A that we got out of it. Simple enough, right? So now we can express next bool simply by mapping over next long. So now we have a random Boolean generator for free. So we still haven't really gotten rid of the boilerplate of having to pass state explicitly. So how do we do that? We sort of need something, um, or sort of we need a way to reason about the value A in the state S and A without having to worry about the S itself. So we sort of want to pull out the value A and sort of bind it. And everybody knows that bind is just another word for? Yes. The name of the conference, right? So let's create flat map, still in a naive way, I want to say. So now we do pretty much the, exactly the same thing we did for map, except we are generating a new state with the f function. So now we pass that, the value a, we get a new state, and then we run it with s1. All right. Simple enough. So now, since we have these two methods, we can use it in a for comprehension. So now, this is the way that you would add three random numbers together. So now we are essentially creating a description of a program. And what it's going to do is that it's going to pull three random longs, and then in the end, it's going to add them all together. And then, in order to be able to run this program, we simply pass the initial seed that we wanted before. So now we sort of solve the problem of having to pass the state explicitly. So now we're really happy. So let's do a bit more contrived example. Now we want to create uh, some random stuff. So we want to create a random customer. So then we can do, we can pull out some ID for the customer identification. We pull out the debt, we create some debt. And then we decide, like, is this a human or not? If it's a human, we name him uh, the human Kim. Otherwise, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and then, of course, we can run this as well to create a random customer. And of course, I experimented with this until I got Mark Zuckerberg. But we're not really there yet. I mean, I've been saying naive all the time, right? So what are things we are missing? Well, is any of this stack safe? No, probably not, since I'm here telling you. <laughs> So we don't have stack safety. So how do we do that? And more importantly, how do we care about effects in this context? Let's, try, let's look at effects first. So this um, bit of a contrived example, perhaps. But like this would be a function that would call into some service, uh, returning something asynchronous to you. Um, as it has the same structure, roughly, as the random number generator. But instead of returning uh, a tuple, it returns the tuple inside an effect, in this case, IO. So now, if we want to create a generator for this called next nonce, we're going to get this nasty mismatch. So we need to change the definition of our state monad to deal with this. So now we have a state transformer instead. So this state transformer takes another argument uh, as a type parameter, this f up here. And we change the definition of the uh, run function to be from state s to the effect container with a tuple inside of an s and an a. So what this does is that now we can, now we can use the same function that we had uh, before in this example. We can simply wrap that and the types line up. So now we can deal with effects. So stack safety, we sort of offloaded that into f. So now it depends on f. Is f stack safe? Well, then state t is also going to be stack safe. We also have some more requirements on f, of course. We need f to be able to be mapped, so we need an instance of functor. We also want to be able to implement flat map, so we want uh, the f to be flat mappable. And of course, this has an equivalent in cats. So in cats, the state is actually just a type alias. So state S and A 
is a state transformer over eval S and A. And in this case, you're probably wondering, what is eval? Well, eval is just some way to defer computations. We could have just as easily put uh, another effect in there. We, have put a, we could have put the ID monad, for instance, which just returns the type it's given. But then we would lose the stack safety. So where is my index monad? We still don't really have it. And also, what are index monads? We still don't really know what they are. Um, so let's try to answer that. Um, before, we had this function, and we're pretty comfortable with it. But it would be even better if we had this function. Because now, we can have one state that can transition into a different kind of state. Still the same shape, roughly, but we have two different states, right? So now, what we can do is that we can chain state transitions together. If we have this, we can have some state one, which gives back a state two, et cetera, and then you can sort of chain these states together. And we can create a wrapper around this called index state, which simply wraps the function run, which now goes from some input state i into an output state and a value a. And we can re-implement the map function that we had before, and it's pretty much exactly the same, except uh, it has an extra type parameter. So that's not too bad, right? Exact same implementation. If we want to change the flat map, we now have to add an extra type parameter to the flat map function. So now it takes OO, which would be the new output type. So you can see that up here, we have a function from I to O. Essentially, if we just look at the states, it's from I to O. And then here, the function that we're passing it goes from O to OO. So that's where the chaining sort of uh, exists, because the output of flat map will take whatever input state we have up here and chain it into the new output state OO. Thus, we have essentially modeled I to O to OO, and we've chained them all together. So if we write that up, it would look something like this. All right, so since we now can model state transition, maybe we can, you know, use this to build something cool, like an API. So we're going to have a really, really simple state machine that we're going to deal with, and it's going to be uh, customer orders. So the order is going to go from initiated, whenever like an order is created. Then the order is going to transition into, like, we've received the order. We acknowledge that it exists. And then we're going to pack the order, and then we're going to ship it and deliver it. So now we don't really want to go from, you know, packed to shipped and then back to received, that would be kind of crazy. So this should be a prime use case for using the index state. So let's create a simple helper function, just set, that will create an index state from IO to unit. Um, and then we can use this. So now we can create helper functions to create an index state received. So the received function takes an initiated state and transitions it into a received state. The packed function takes a state that is received and turns it into packed and so on. So we sort of chain everything together like this. And now we can use this in a for comprehension, same as we did before. And since the time line up, we can actually run this program using initiated. And you can see that in the end here, we're in the state delivered. So the compiler here can also help you if you screw up. So this program is invalid, right? We're delivering something, and then we're packaging it. That's not really possible. So the compiler will here tell you that, hey, you know, I found an index state from received to packed, but I actually need something that goes from delivered into something else. So the compiler can help you out at compile time, which is really great. And the index state in cats sort of looks the same as this, if you squint a bit, right? There are some differences, like the function, the run function here is wrapped in some f. But they're almost equivalent to the naive implementation we just wrote, other than this f here, as well as the extra type parameter here. So this does look familiar to what we had before, right? So, hmm, what could this be? Well, another type alias, of course. So state t is actually an index state. 
So essentially, it's an index state that doesn't transition into a different type of state. So that's pretty cool. So the epiphany you guys should be having right now, if you haven't already gotten it, and of course, I have to push a meme into this. So first, we have like the beginner programmer, the tiny brain. Now we're passing state explicitly. Then we find out that, oh, this is a common pattern. All right, very cool. And then we have a monad. Now we're really happy. And then we find out about state transformers, and so now we can deal with effects, awesome. And then we find out that the state is actually a state T. Oh my god. And then we find out about index state, excellent. And then we find out that the state transform is actually an index state. That's really cool. So when it comes to designing APIs using index state, it's really, it's really a nice way to sort of um, enforce proper usage of your API. So let's take a look at our order status API again and you sort of give you guys a sense of how you could use this in practice. And one idea would be to create an HTTP service with a bunch of different routes like this. So you have one uh, route that can give you the status um, of some order. You have something to create an order. And you have something to patch the status of an order. Can anyone spot the mistake? So it's the third line, or not the third line, but the third sort of, yes. Exactly. So we don't want to do that. So let's, let's make this a bit better. We now create an API with some helper functions. We have something to create an order, which gives us back an index state in the context of IO that takes the state from initiated to received and gives back an order ID. And then we have a package function, which takes an order ID. It needs some reference in the database, right? And then it will uh, persist that the order has now been packed, and then it will return unit because we really don't care about any result here. And then we do the same for shipped and delivered. So now we can create a, um, a program for this and run it. So here we are doing uh, first packaging and then shipping, and then we simply run this um, with run s. That just gives you back the state without dealing with the value. And then we can do run on safe sync and to get back the state so we can see that it properly works. So now we can rewrite this and get the same thing. So in the third uh, clause here, we're essentially taking the state from the database. Um, we're making sure that it is of the type received. And then we pack and ship um, the product uh, using the R that was returned from the state. So the received state will be returned. And then finally, we yield an OK in the end of this. So that's really cool. And in fact, like this sort of seems similar to protocols. So you could use an index state um, to, um, to encode um, proper usages of protocols. And in fact, that was what Oscar did last year. So we're always one year behind with Scala, behind Haskell and TypeScript. Um, but, and there's also like other usages for this as well. Like, for instance, you can create something like session types for this as well. Um, for instance, here is a, uh, a toy example of doing SSL handshaking using, using index states. But of course, like, it's not all magical ponytails and fairies, right? But there has to be some downside to using index states. And for instance, what if you have two unrelated states that you want to modify in the same program? So you sort of want to say, uh, we're going to do the packaging and the shipping but we're also going to notify the user, and we don't want to do that twice. So we have a state machine for that as well. All right, but now you can't really put these in the same fork comprehension because the monads don't line up. All right, so what do we do about this? Well, Shapeless says, hold my beer, and we'll do this. So the answer to this problem is hlists. So what you can do is to say that you want to mutate uh, states individually inside this hlist. So for instance here, you can see that between the first and second line, the thing that changes is s. So s goes from s1 to s2. And in the third line, you can see that r1 has transitioned into r2. So now you can actually, if we could model this somehow, 
then we could actually have mutation of several different states at once. So let's create some unrelated case class whatever, and then create a function that does this. So we actually did a prototype of this, so it actually works, but we, we don't dare to put it into production. Um, but simply put, what it does is that it makes sure that received, in this case of packed, exists once within this h list i, which would be the input state to your program. And then the output here would compute a new h list that contains the same states that it had before, except received, and replacing the received state with the packed state. So therefore, you could use the same thing, index state t set o dot out. And now you can see that I run this packed uh, 0l, run s, I get back received whatever, an h nil. So that seemed to work. And then, of course, let's also see that we can combine it in the fork comprehension. So you can do the same thing with shipped. It, it takes two implicit parameters, and then uh, it returns an index state, IO, and unit. And you can see that in the end here, we have um, sort of fixed this in on the with the help of shapeless. So should you do this? Um, answer is probably not. Um, we didn't dare to. Um, Another thing like, I sort of want to leave you with is the f parameter. So in some of the examples, I put f to be IO, which is pretty common to do. But it's actually a pretty good idea to delay the evaluation as long as possible. So you could actually, using type constraints, saying like, oh, f has to have flat map, or f has to be an applicative, you can actually delay the choosing of your effect as long as possible, which is a really great option, especially if you want to do like testing, you don't want to have things be asynchronous. It's really nice to be able to uh, defer it in some way. It's also really nice to be able to say, well, how do we handle errors in this function? Should it return an option? Should it be you know, a monad error instead? That sort of thing is really cool. Um, so in conclusion, um, index states are great for getting rid of the explicit passing of states. Uh, with help of the index state monad, you can uh, model finite state machines. You can design protocols and have something similar to session types. You should also delay choosing uh, your effect and regain control over your API. Thanks a lot. So why did I not dare put this into production? Well, uh, one thing is like you should never put anything into production that you're the single person that understands. <laughs> um, and so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, it's I, when it comes to shapeless derivation, you sort of have to do a lot of testing to have high confidence that all the derivation is correct. And uh, I did not put time into doing that. So that's why. Uh, so, <laughs> so John's question is, uh, <laughs> did you consider using my library <laughs> instead of using <laughs> Shapeless? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean. True. Yes. Yeah. So essentially, John's question is, why did you not use subtyping instead of uh, the H list thing? And sort of like when you model this, you can see that. Um, let's go back to the API definition. So you can see that this is sort of a sealed hierarchy, and you don't really need this to be a sealed hierarchy. You could have this be. Uh, things that are totally disjoint, they would not need the seal trait. The reason why I want a seal trait here is to be able to get something out of the database um, for the state machine and then check if that was the correct state that we wanted. So then I do like a uh, pattern match and I essentially we do um, race error if it's not the correct state. Um, so that's why we didn't do the subtyping in that in that way, sort of. 
Yeah, but like, so you're still you're still using subtyping here in the sealed hierarchy, right? No. Okay, we'll talk after the. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, any other questions? All right. Great. I have some plugs. Um, that's cats. Um, like the documentation is excellent on this, so read that. Um, the control monad state in Hackage is also a really good source of uh, information. Um, I used Pandoc include by Oscar and Tut for the for the slides. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>